Love it. Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream. I've been on air and on podcast for 13 years. This is an award-winning podcast, both from the People's Choice Awards as well as the Webby Awards, which makes me very happy and proud to say, and I have you absolutely to thank for that. So what do I do out in the world? I am a visibility media shaman. I help you to write a page turner book. I take authors to a guaranteed international bestseller status, and I teach you the ultimate visibility formula, how you can be interviewed on a radio and podcast and get mad results. So I love working with my clients and I work, love working with my groups. We're rolling some new things out you'll want to be aware of at this really, <clears throat> excuse me, very interesting time. Clearly that's truth. <laughs> as I take a drink of water. <clears throat> it is very interesting times. And for that reason, I'm catering to very interesting people. And so if you are somebody who's always wanted to write a book and you're sitting at home bored out of your gourd, and it really is your time to get your message, your story, your whimsy out into the world, let me take you there. I'm coaching people right now through a group membership and you go to my website, debbie-dashinger.com slash visible visionaries and we've got monthly rates so if you want to just join for a month or a couple of months you can come on in if you want to do a month program obviously major super saving and i've i've priced this literally for this time i've never had prices like this but i'm here to serve i'm here to help you finish your book get it from inception to the finish line so debbie-dashinger.com slash visible visionaries write your damn book and the other opportunity that I have for you is for those who would like to only write a chapter or are called to write something about dogs, pets, canines, you can be a vet, pet industry, dog lover. I am rolling out the new book entitled The Ultimate Anthology Book for Dog Lovers. And you got to know that ultimate is M-U-T-T -T, as in mutt. Haha. <laughs> so unless you're covered from head to tail, in dog hair. Life ain't that good. If you're a dog lover and you'd like to contribute a chapter to the anthology, go to debbied.net slash anthology. It's D-E-B-B-I-D.net slash anthology. And the show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do beautiful energy work out into the world and we're grateful for them and all the healing that they do. And I've got two guests. How does it get any better than that? I'm so fortunate today to have two guests on the show, my treasure. And we're starting out today with James Robolata, who's an author, speaker, coach, MC, and entrepreneur. He wrote the book, Leading Imperfectly, and he speaks internationally about authentic leadership, vulnerability, and storytelling. His clients include, amongst many, Amex and G. G GE as in General Electric. He is also a life coach and hosts his own event called Living Imperfectly Live. His goal is to help attendees start living the life we say that we want to live. If you'd like to find out more, go to his website at his name, except it's a little bit of a robo. It's jamestrobo.com. James, welcome to Dare to Dream. It is so wonderful to have you here, my friend. Debbie, how are we doing today, friend? You look enigmatic today. Oh, what does that word mean? It sounds <laughs> good. <laughs> you're an enigma. You look. It's, it's, you just. You just. You just. You're a ray of light. I always love spending time with you, Debbie. Uh, from when we met just uh, just a few weeks ago, you just. I just enjoy. I can't have a bad day when you're hanging out with you. Right on. Thank you. Yeah, five healthy weeks ago we met, and who would have thunk <laughs> it, right? But you know, you were, you know, same right back at you, James, because you're um, riveting on stage. And I have so many questions I want to ask you. I think where I want to start first is what, as an author, as a speaker, as a coach, so somebody who majors, if you will, in storytelling, how did you make a shift? What allowed you to go past any experiences when you were younger and maybe felt some expectations and say, you know, that's not my path. I'm going to carve this path instead. What helped you do that? 
Yeah, for sure. I, I'm, I'm very fortunate that uh, I have parents that are super supportive of me. I'm very, very grateful for them and, and the opportunities that they provided. You know, it's interesting. When I went to college, I thought I wanted to be a marine biologist. Uh, and I actually have my BS in marine biology. There's a fun fact for you. Um, and, uh, but around my junior year, I realized I was putting too many jokes in my scientific papers. My teachers were like, this may not be for you. And I was like, I think I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I actually went on to get a master's in counseling. Um, and I worked in higher education for a while, uh, developing leaders, uh, both students and professionals. And it was in that time where I realized I love helping individuals uh, do what they say they want to do. Um, I, I've, I think I have a gift of helping people point out, uh, of helping point out to people where they're getting stuck. Um, and, uh, and so for me, I left that job on a whim to try to be a professional speaker. And I said, this is it, let's go and let's try. I think what helped me is that I didn't have at that time, I didn't have that time anything crazy responsibility wise, right? I, I, I was in a relationship, but we were young and in love. And I was also, uh, I wouldn't have any kids. And so you could take risks and, and feel pretty good about it. But there was part of me that was like, listen, if I don't do it now, I'm never gonna do it. I'm just gonna keep making excuses and I'm trying not to do that. So as a speaker, really, yeah. these are really weird times, right? I mean, because most of your events have been canceled, like every other speaker. So what are you doing to sustain yourself? Do you have anything new that you're working on? Any projects, any places you're exploring? Yeah, for sure. Now, are you asking that before or after the fetal position, Debbie? Which uh, <laughs> before shortly or after, after I get after. Shortly. Fetal. Okay, good. So post tears. All right, great. Um, yeah, no, you're right, Debbie. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I make a living getting in front of large, crowded groups of people and, and trying to move and trying to move them. Um, and so this has been very interesting. I have pivoted to some programs doing them virtually. It's been nice to have some clients that have wanted to do that. Um, and then also, I did use this opportunity to, uh, to start something new. Um, I've had a, 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 a something on my brain and actually going to the New Media Summit helped me with this. I've had something on my brain for about six years and just, just didn't think I was good enough, just didn't think people would enjoy it, didn't think, you know, all the, all the just, you know, things that we put in our way. I wrote, a, wrote myself a lot of stories, um, but I started a brand new thing. It's called Diner Talks. Um, and it is a, a Facebook live show. It'll also be a podcast uh, sooner than later. Um, but it is an opportunity. I think the best conversations that we have in our lives occur after the hour of 10 o'clock at late night eateries huh. at your diners, Denny's, IHOP. Over a BLT. Out, over a BLT or, or a gluttonous stack of pancakes. And uh, yeah, I love those moments because you have really cool conversations with people that you love. And so I wanted to try to recreate that. And that's what this show is, is having deep conversations conversations with laughter with people that care about each other. Now, have you recorded any of them? Because I'm wondering about the pancakes and the food and how you're, how you're making that connection at this time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's a little bit weird going Facebook Live right now because I can't go to a diner. Uh, so the goal, actually, what I'm using this opportunity as is like, let's let's work it out. Let me work out the kinks. And uh, I mean, ultimately, you can get all the production behind it and put it into a diner and put it into some of those places. But uh, the show itself has to be solid first. And so let's just get the show out there and start having a conversation. So I do That's it awesome. like you live streaming type stuff. And I put a diner in the background, but that's about <laughs> as close to greasy things as we get. <laughs> that's great. You have to have a really bad cup of joe sitting in front of you as well. Yeah, for sure. I got my diner mug. You know, as a talk show, <laughs> as a talk show host, you still need some sort of a mug. That's one thing I learned. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really important product placement for yourself. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so storytelling, like I really love that. And that's something that I continue to explore also as a speaker. And um, I find that every time I work with, well, certain people, they add, they really add something to the mix that I never would have known before, never would have thought about. I know this is your expertise. So what is it about storytelling? Like if you could give me one thing that is germane to really telling a story that can not just move an audience, but maybe move them forward to want to work with you, like really create that connection what would you recommend? Yeah, for sure. I think one of the biggest things is that a lot of people approach speaking, approach being on stage, even in front of meetings, uh, they, get con they get confused between credibility and relatability. And credibility is your degree, it's your job title, it's how much money you made in Q4, it's like that kind of stuff. Uh, but relatability is 
what you learned from that degree and how you're applying it. Um, it is how you got to that job. It is uh, your slips and your struggles and your entrepreneurial journey, things like that. And relatability is where we see a lot of power in speaking and storytelling because uh, when we see ourselves in someone else, we believe that we can. Mm. And so by creating that relatable moment uh, is really powerful. So it's, it's truly coming at your audience is like, hey, another fellow human being here. Uh, I got something that I've been through that I think maybe you are going through, could have gone through that will relate to you. I want to share a little bit of my story. What about I, emotions when you do that? Because there's, there's different camps on that. And I know you shouldn't be losing it. Like if you're, if you're in the middle of a crisis, that is not one to share your story. Wait till you're over it. You've gained the wisdom. But what about in general, the idea of using emotion when you tell your story? Yeah, I think it's every speaker's job to move an audience. And, and I think it's I ideally try to take them on a roller coaster. Mm. Because for me, my speaking style is I get you laughing and then I sucker punch you in the feels, right? <laughs> but for me, like I use laughter as a way to lower your barriers, make you feel like, oh, maybe this isn't going to be so bad. And then I sneak attack you with some, uh, some poignant points. And so exactly what you're talking about, Debbie, is crucial. I mean, ideally trying to get your audience lighter and more comfortable and, and realizing that, hey, this person's got us, that we can, we can sit back in our chair a little bit. We don't have to worry about them sucking. Um, <laughs> and then your emotions come in, but it's letting individuals feel some of those emotions, right? Is it you openly weeping on stage? Maybe, maybe not. But I think if your voice cracks a little bit at a, at a, at a point, then there's some real, people want to see real. Mm. You can recognize fake from a mile away. We know what fake feels like. Um, and so authenticity uh, breeds community. Yeah, that's great. That leads me to wonder, you also coach and help people on leadership, leading imperfectly leading authentically, words that I really love, which is very much like what you're saying right now. It's about being real. That's the component there. How do you help people to <clears throat> unpack themselves or uh, lower their barriers, become really transparent so they can still be very profound and powerful leaders, and yet they're showing you something that sort of makes you fall in love with them, and it's imperfect, but you're following their lead or they are being really authentic and it's something you can say like, I, I really appreciate this person. That seems to me a gift, like a charismatic gift. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, ultimately, I think we as humans learn things from people who are imperfect. We don't learn things from people who are perfect um, just because there's so much value in that story, in that journey. And so that's why, um, that's what good leaders need to do. They need to own who they are so they can be real to other people. But when it comes to this, I think, I guess a question that I'd almost throw back at you, if, you, if, you, if you're willing to dance a little bit, um, is in your eyes, what's the difference between being a hero and being a role model, Debbie? Oh, I feel like energetically it's a light year's difference. I feel like a hero is somebody who overcomes ridiculous obstacles, hero or shiro, and has a quest, right? It's a little bit of a Don Quixote. And they're not going to end till they hur, hur, one obstacle at a time. And there is a benefit to them and usually to other people for them achieving whatever that goal is. A role model, it doesn't have the same energy to it for me. And I would say a role model is somebody that people look up to. Um, maybe they're, they've got a paradigm going on and people say, oh, I'd like to be like that. But they feel more untouchable. Interesting. I'm so glad we had this conversation uh, because I think that uh, I think that I almost flipped the two, but I still use the words in a slightly different way. So for me, and I'm so glad that I asked you that because this is such a cool thing to think about. Uh, because ultimately, when we teach leadership, I think we want more role models in the workplace and less heroes. Because when I say heroes, I think heroes save you, but role models help you save yourself. Mm. And heroes are trying to be like this perfect individual that we see right up there with the cape and they swoop down and they save the day, but we don't need saving. We need community. Um, and so, uh, so in that space, like heroes are kind of up here on this pedestal, whereas role models are down amongst the individuals, the people that I consider role models, I consider role models because I see what they do for others. They make me want to do better. They lead by example, but I also see the times where they slipped and they struggled and they made me realize that maybe right now where I am is okay. 
that I'm enough and that I can grow and that I can go. Um, and so that's a lot of what I think leaders need to see is not like, hey, cool, slap a title on me. Now I have to be this thing. You weren't hired because you were the most perfect. No one puts that expectation on you. You were hired because you're the most trusted. And it's very different uh, when we think about how that, uh, that kind of an individual would attack leading a team. And who would be a role model for you? Who's somebody who really carves out a path that you just think, wow, I, I would love to be somewhat more like you. Yeah, for sure. I think when I pick my role models, it's interesting. I pick people that are like three years ahead of me because the breadcrumbs that they dropped haven't disintegrated right? Like they're still there. Um, as opposed to some of these hallmark individuals, like you know, as a professional speaker, I can look up to the, the Tony Robbins, the Gary Vaynerchuks, Eric Thomas, like some of these, you know, incredible individuals. Um, and, and I certainly do look up to them, but they're more like heroes. They're like almost like untouchable, where it's like, oh man, they're just, they're, they're, they're just way up on this pedestal. Um, and so I have individuals that I look up to, it's a guy by the name of Tom Krigelstein, uh, Mr. Jeff Des, a couple of individuals like that, or they're just a few years ahead of me that the way that they think is causing me to be better. And the fact that I can watch them try and fail and try and win is like, okay, maybe I can keep trying and just and kind of encourage me to keep it moving. Yeah, that makes sense. So these days, I imagine you're sort of your own role model, <laughs> you know, <laughs> quarantining and all of that. What are you doing right now that's unique besides your diner series? What, what are there ways that you are picking up new habits or making new choices that feel really positive, things you are wanting to bring forward and that are actually creating a lot of change for you? I think one of the most powerful things to do is something actually that we're doing here at home. And, and my, my wife and I, uh, it's so simple, but we, we go for a walk every day and the walk is an hour long. And in the middle of, my, my wife is also a professional speaker. So in the midst of Zoom calls and writing curriculum and like trying to record a video and post it to YouTube, uh, we'll check in with each other. I'm like, oh, what do you want for dinner later? Or, How are you doing? You good? Or hey, can I run this by you? But it's not intentional. And so taking the intention uh, making the intention to spend that hour with her every day of going on a walk. And we have some of the, we have some hard conversations during that time, but we also have some really cool conversations. It's been a space to dream. It's been a space to check in on our relationship. I think that's been one of the things that's made this quarantine a lot more special because we live in an apartment. So we don't have green space. We don't have not many places we can go to hide. Uh, and, uh, and so that's probably been one of the biggest things. And then I would say as far as work wise, as far as work-wise, what I'm trying to do, uh, what I'm trying to do is, as much like you said in your intro, is how can we serve right now? Uh, you know, finances are weird, uh, budgets are getting cut, people are getting furloughed, um, and so I've been offering a bunch of free things, and also a couple of like pay what you can things, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm I'm hosting my uh, a virtual version of my Living Imperfectly Live. It's gonna be a day long thing on May 16th, and it's a pay what you can, and you can pay anywhere from $10 to $100 and whatever you feel like paying, you're going to get the same exact experience. Um, and so, you know, those kind of things is just shifting a little bit, like you mentioned, kind of shifting some of your rates around for this, uh, the, for this opportunity that people can have to really try to make something different of their lives. Yeah, so important. Right. Thank you. Um, and that's so great. I love the idea of you guys taking your walk, having your time, your together time and I'm also in Los Angeles, so I can relate. You know, I do the best I can. I'm in a nice area, but, you know, yeah, I'm not out in the country. Right, sure. <laughs> I would be the bomb right now. Um, <clears throat> and you told a story when I first met you about Shania Twain, and I just thought it would be really lovely for people to hear this story. Would you share? <laughs> And now for something completely different. Uh, so, uh, yeah, no, happily, uh, happily. So um, uh, long story short, friends, at my senior prom, I dislocated my right knee dancing to Shania Twain's Man, I Feel Like a Woman. Now, here's the thing. It's come up, there's some other details you need to know. First off, that actually occurred during dinner, okay? <laughs> See, I don't know who the DJ was at my senior prom, but dude was dropping straight fire all night. And you know how, Debbie, you know what normally at formal events, at proms, weddings, receptions, things like that, normally during dinner, they'll like drop it down, play like some smooth <laughs> jazz or some Billy Joel. No, my man just kept coming with the hits. And so me and my friends were standing around being like, yo, 
if he's going to keep the dance floor hot, we got to make sure it doesn't get chilly. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, so we got out there and I skipped the first meal of my life that night, Debbie. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so, man, I feel like a woman comes on. And when that song comes on, you really have two choices in life. You either go hard or you go home. So I went hard. I was jumping around, jumped onto my right leg and my knee blew out. I then had to, when I fell to the ground, I popped my own knee back in. Oh. I then proceeded to drag myself to the side of the dance floor. <laughs> my principal rushed over to me and handed me three ice cubes. I still don't know if those three ice cubes were for my inflammation or for my water. But either way, very sweet, ma'am. <laughs> my, that's it, Debbie. Yeah, my friends dragged me to the side. My friends dragged me over to some chairs. They helped me get up. They gave me some chicken parmesan. I cried into some chicken parmesan. You know, some of y'all call those Tuesdays. And, uh, and uh, so, yeah, but I got back out on the dance floor later because I told myself, I said, James, this is your senior prom, bro. This is like the biggest day of your life, basically. You have a hot date. You need to get out there. And uh, so later on in the night, we were out there that played the song Just Bust a Move. <laughs> Only everybody at my senior prom was like, hey, y'all, 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 know, y'all know this song, right? You want it. And you got it. So I played the track only. Everybody in my senior prom was like, hey, just bust a knee. <laughs> Debbie, that's, that's disrespectful, what they did to me. <laughs> but I got to say, your date is so lucky. I am amazed the lengths you went to be there fully present that night and not be dragged out on a stretcher. You're right. That is impressive, James. It, it's funny because we were both lucky – uh, but neither of us got lucky. So, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> but did you ever have to have surgery? Uh, I have had surgery, yeah. So it turns out bad knees run in my family. Um, mm-hmm. And so I've actually, I've dislocated my knee a few times mm-hmm. and uh, wound up having surgery uh, about halfway through college to try to tighten it down a little bit. So. Yeah. I had two knee <laughs> surgeries myself. I know. Good times. I said, you know, I think the running career is over. I'm not going to, I'm not going that route anymore. <laughs> That's you gave it a shot though. And I respect that. That's right. Race walking <laughs> for me from now on. I can handle it. I can handle it. So dare to dream, James, this is dare to dream. What are your future dreams and goals? What haven't you done that you'd really love to create or be? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so a little bit of this Diner Talks with James is a start to that dream. Um, I want to get on, uh, I would love to be on television and whatever television looks like at the opportunity they get on, whether that's streaming, whether that's, uh, you know, who knows what it'll look like. But uh, I would love the opportunity to have, uh, be in front of bigger audiences and, and having really cool, meaningful conversations with a lot of laughter um, and getting people to pause. Mm. My biggest goal, and I think one of my biggest gifts is to get individuals to pause for just a moment. And, and, and whether it's to pause and think about their own lives, their own patterns, where are they stuck? What are they doing? Um, and, uh, and so when you pause, you can create that space. But if you never pause and you get caught in the hamster wheel of life and our patterns just repeat and we can never pivot. And so that's really what I'm trying to do is uh, ultimately I want to, I have one book. I want to write another, I'm going to write another book at some point uh, as well. Excited to hear about the resource that you have around that Debbie. And, uh, and, and so, yeah, so, uh, so I'll be writing more books and the goal is to just get in front of more, get in front of more cameras and in front of more people and really start to spread this. You need to, we need you. We need you. We need to laugh more and to be sucker punched. <laughs> really. I'm, I'm up for that any day. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me if you could say, cause you coach people and you speak from stage. So this is part of what you do around leadership and helping attendees. But if they're, and, and I guess what I'm taking into account is for all of us with our expertise, I know it's so for me, I see things that people let's say do around books or interviews that I just think, Mamma mia, it's such a waste <laughs> because if only you would knock out one, two, three, and instead put on X, Y, Z, I promise you just that, you will stop sabotaging yourself and have enormous success and get there quicker. So in your world, James, how is that so? What is it that you just wish you could either tell people, please stop or please implement this and you will be brilliant? Yeah. One simple thing is to stop shooting on yourself. Uh, right. I mean, we should on ourselves left and right. I mean, I know 
for in many periods of my life, I'm like, James, don't go talk to them. Don't approach them. Don't ask for that. Uh, you're not cool enough. You're not funny enough. You're not smart enough. You're not hot enough. You're not successful enough. You're not rich enough, whatever. And, I, and you tell you, write, you write yourself these stories that you're not enough. And then you lead through imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and you I try to act through imposter syndrome because you're like, if I'm never good enough to be in this space and all I'm doing is faking things, right? We all know the phrase, fake it till you make it. But let's be honest, if all you ever do is fake it, you never really make it. And so that is why we've got to start rewriting the lies and the stories that we are telling ourselves and recognizing that maybe, just maybe, you are enough. You are right where you need to be. Um, and so that's, that's a big, heady concept that I try to get people to wrap their brain around, um, is that you have the tools. You have the skill set to start. So many people put barriers in their own ways. They're like, well, I need to do this before I do this, right? Whenever you talk to someone who's a, who wants to be a speaker, they're like, oh, well, let me write a book and then I can be a speaker. That's not true, right? People want to start a podcast. Well, I got to buy a microphone before I can start a podcast. No, you're building that barrier. You're putting barriers in your way of starting and they're not helping you. You can just start and grow and build. That's actually a really huge tip, I have to say, because along the lines of you teaching about being imperfect, it's the most beautiful place to start. I could tell you when I began in radio 13 years ago this June that I was terrified. Talk about, we're going to get to you in just a sec, Eli. Um, in the beginning, when I first got started, I was so scared. Uh, it was like guerrilla radio working all the equipment, plus I got cans on my head, plus I have people calling in, plus it was a lot. And I didn't have formal training. I came from being an actress and a singer. And so for me, what was really interesting was I had to let go. I actually had to uh, just say, you know, like for today, this is the best I'm gonna do. And when the show is done, I'll listen back and I'll know I'm good. I've been around the block, you know, I'll know what works. Uh, I wasn't shooting on myself. I'll know what doesn't work and I'll improve. So I started out, I'm sure if I listened back to my original shows, they would be someone who really was trying and wanted to be liked, but was probably adorable and had a lot of good stuff and talent too. But I kept at it week after week after week. And honestly, every time I went to a new station, because I did, and when I got offers, I went through the same thing. It was all new equipment, a whole new station, a whole new studio, new management. I was so scared, but I would yeah. just show up and imperfectly do it. And then here I am today. You know, you could, <laughs> I could be sleeping and doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that's how comfortable I feel today. And I think it's like a great memory or reference point to bring forward into everything we do is just, just do it really just start. Like you have enough right now. You are enough right now. And if you'll just put one foot in front of the other, what will unfold will be perfect. Perfectly imperfect. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we know that even in sales, one of the greatest things is differentiation and your imperfections are what differentiate you from everybody else. Um, and so why wouldn't we lean into those beautiful things, those stories that you have, the experiences that you have? Uh, I, I love it. And I'm, and I'm grateful that you leaned into your imperfections, Debbie, because we all benefit from it. Thanks, James. Tell us again where we can find you. Absolutely. I'm James T. Robo everywhere over the internet. Uh, James T. Robo on Instagram. I'm posting some meaningful content there. And on YouTube, you can just look up my name there. James T. Robo.com. If you want to hear more about my living and perfectly live events, my speaking, my coaching, it'd be special to connect with you folks. Awesome. Well worth it. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Appreciate you. I appreciate you, Frank. Good to see you. You too, James. Hopefully soon again. I love it. You take care, Debbie. Bye, Diner Man. Bye-bye. Well, folks, uh, here we are. We're heading into the second half of the show. And as I am gearing up to let my next guest in, this is going to be Eli Adelson. He'll be here in a moment. And uh, I'm just going to ask you the question as we get started, how can things work out in your favor effortlessly? Oh. 
first of all, the vibration of the word effortless is so beautiful to me. So just, I want to like be felling in that right now. How can things work out in your favor effortlessly? My guest now is the co-owner of Peace and Harmony Company, Eli Adelson, who built the company up to a high six-figure business while traveling the world, living abroad in Europe and Asia, and finishing a degree from UMass while in Thailand. While not everything works out perfectly, he lives a life most people dream of. I'm also friends with his dad, and he as well, so it's really great to have him here, and his dad will be on uh, in a month. So how does it get any better than that than the Adelson family? So when Eli is passionately helping others live in flow. He's all about letting people experience their synchronicity, more success, more joy, more often in both business and life. And you can find out more about him at peaceandharmonyco.com. You're here. It's so good yeah. to see you, Eli. Welcome to Dare to Dream. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. It's so great to hang out with you. You know, when I first heard you speak, we were in an event together and you got up and honestly, I think I blacked out at some point because you literally described my life, my dream life, not the life I live, my dream life. But here you are a youngin, and you were basically saying I've traveled, well, it's over 24 countries and I've done this and I've done this, but you also had such a presence about you. It was not an efforting and it was a real, um, like, I'm living a damn fine life kind of guy. And I was like, I remember giving you my card and it's like, okay, we need to connect because this is a beautiful thing. So, gosh, there's so many places I can start with you, but let us start with Peace and Harmony Company. Awesome. And I just want to let people know that while Eli and I are talking, there is something actually playing in the background that you cannot hear. But I'm gonna let you explain it, Eli, because your dad recommended that I run the YouTube video version as well as the podcaster version. So we have two going. Oh, wow. Hello. Yeah, well, I, I mean, not to complicate things, but I've got this little one running as well. So we got three going on. <laughs> That's beautiful, okay. Yeah. Lucky so, uh, again, thank you so much for having me here and, and taking the time and, and speaking to me. And, and thank you so much for playing the program on your podcast. And I'm so happy that you enjoy it and get a lot out of it. So thank you. Uh, yeah, so the program is called Peace and Harmony. And basically what it does is it, it helps bring in all these positive energies to, to get rid of stress and negativity and any tension and kind of uplift you and, and uplift around you as well, which is absolutely perfect for this time of, of year when we're kind of cooped up and, and whatnot. So in terms of actual tangible results, it'd be less arguing, arguing with your family, your, your spouse, uh, thing is kind of just working better. You're not feeling like you're going crazy after having cabin fever for so long and, and you being a little bit more comfortable with everything that's going on, even though there's so much discomfort going on. And, and so it's called Peace and Harmony. It's free. It, you can you don't even have to opt in. It's available at uh, peaceandharmonydownload.com. And I highly recommend everyone try it. And all you have to do is go to the page, hit play, and make sure your sound is up. So. That's an amazing project that we're working on now, and we're going for uh, one million pockets of peace in the U.S. And we may have been a little bit over ambitious with our goal, but we're shooting for July fourth. Everybody's at home. What else could you do except get uplifted? You know, no, it's for real. And I'm I am a sensitive. If something's flatlining, and it, I'll just say it doesn't work for me. I won't say for everybody. I know it. I turned it on, and it was I was like, what? This is immediate. This is so powerful. And I actually spent an hour with your dad yesterday, David. And um, he said, I feel strongly. I want you to see something. He turned his entire computer around and said, I want you to watch the TV because I'm being told you need to watch like this is whatever the $6,000, $7,000, you know, entire TV set, 65 inch screen. And, you know, the whole right, system. Right. <laughs> I think maybe for five minutes I watched it. And he came back and tried to have a conversation with me. And he said, Debbie, you need to lay down. I did. I couldn't <laughs> speak. What? 
that was so powerful. Yeah. Are you around this all the time? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe I'm not as sensitive as, as other people, or maybe I just don't realize the effect it's having or, or, or whatnot, but um, yeah, and I, I'm staying with him right now because I'm unable to travel versus with everything that's going on. So he's got uh, that one 65 inch one, and then two other laptop units, and then between the, th the three of us, um, him, his wife, and me, we have all these hand. We have uh, like two or three handheld units each that are running, and they're all running different programs. And but this is the environment that um, that I'm currently residing in. <laughs> oh gosh! All right. And the inspiration behind all this, peace and harmony, what is it? That's a question for David. I can kind of speculate, but um, I, we've never actually sat down and, and had a conversation. Uh, basically, he is super compassionate and super kind and, and really wants to help out the world. And one of his missions here was, was helping out the world to a certain degree. And through that came these programs and some more esoteric divine connection download type thing. I, I don't entirely know how it works. Um, but then these came about and, and for the last, um, I think we've been working together about nine years now, around nine years, we've been working at getting these programs out and, and, uh, from a marketing standpoint, when you keep coming out with a new program every couple of weeks, it makes it pretty hard. <laughs> Upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. Yeah. Uh, so his thing is just creating more and more programs. And I think he's over 700 programs now. And, and we don't offer all 700. We don't, definitely don't sell all of them. Uh, it's, I, last I checked, it was over 300 on the, on the store. Gee. Well, if you need beta testers, you know, you know where I am. Because right, well, <laughs> I'm in. I'm totally in. Thank you so much. I, I so appreciate that. So I hear an accent. I didn't hear an accent when we met. I'm hearing an accent. A little bit English? What is going on there? Yeah, it, uh, it fluctuates. It comes and goes, uh, probably from traveling for so long and being away for so long. And um, So what it was when I first started traveling? Tell me. Yeah, please. I, I went to Japan mm -hmm. and I stayed there for three months and, and explored a lot of Japan. And I didn't really speak Japanese and they don't really speak English there. And most of the people that I met were English, Irish, Australian. So I started hanging out with them. Mm. And so a lot of the time I was either speaking to them or I wasn't speaking or I was speaking like broken English and, and trying to get by. And so that happened for three months. And then I went to Australia for a couple of months and then Australia hanging out with Irish, Scottish um, and Australian. And then I, I guess it just kind of, picked it up along the way because I wasn't used to speaking English so much. Amazing. And it's, so you have the bug. Is it just like traveling is your thing or tell me about that. And how do you know where you're going to go next? And how do you know how long you're going to stay or where are you going to stay? Yeah. So I, I, I had the bug. I, I, I have like a mild version of it now, you know, <laughs> like I, I've calmed down as I've, I've grown up a little bit, but uh, basically it was, I want to go out and I want to see the world and I want to learn about all these different cultures and see how the world works in these different places. And uh, J Japan, it's uh, like, I was always kind of interested in, in that. And that I did Aikido when I was a little kid and um, was, was into anime and, and whatnot. And, and so I figured that'll throw me so far out of my comfort zone. I don't speak the language and, and everything is so different there from anything I'm used to. So I figured if I'm going to start, I may as well just go completely out of my element. So I, I did that. And then um, I, I thought Australia would be fun. And I went there. And, and it was fun, but it was a little bit too much partying at the time. Mm. And, and then basically, as I, as I progressed, I, I, I knew what to look for. And so I ended up living in, in Thailand for six years, actually. That's a long time. Yeah. And, and so from there, uh, I had a lot of jump off trips for, for visa runs and things like that. And 
and how I would pick countries is uh, more recently, I, I would just go to this website called Air Asia, and it's a budget airline for Asia. And I basically just see what, what travel deals they had, what was, what seemed interesting, what, what was cheap um, and didn't take a crazy amount of time to travel to. So any like under three hours, under four hours is kind of the limit I set. And then, and then I just randomly pick amounts of time and say, oh, okay, I think based on all my other experience traveling, that if I want to get a really good culture and, and, um, and see a sense of it, then 10 days is, is pretty optimal. 10 days to two weeks, it'll give you enough of a taste. And I don't know why, but I'm thinking about a, a trip to Sri Lanka that I went to recently. How uh, uh, So I was living in Malaysia and I needed to do visa runs every, every few months or whatnot. Basically leave the country and come back and renew for the, the 90 days. And, and so and I, you talk to David a lot and I don't know if you know, but he's really big on, um, on, on Vedic um, literature, astrology and, and, and that, and like the Ramayana and, and whatnot. So I grew up with all these stories about it. And, and there's one story where Hanuman jumps from the tip of India to Sri Lanka to look for Sita, which is Ram's wife that was captured by the bad guy, um, Robin Ravana, depending on it. And so I saw these tickets to um, Sri Lanka for like $120. Wow. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm, I'm going there. And, and then I want to go and look at these places. And, and there's, a, there's a footprint of Hanuman when, when you landed from the jump. And so I really wanted to go to that temple and, and see what that was like. And, and that was the whole reason I, I went to, to Sri Lanka is basically to go see that. And then planning that trip, I, I don't really plan. I just kind of have a, a loose outline and and so it's like okay how much time is it going to take to get to to this uh, area it's called uh nirwana helia it's in in this in the tea plantations in the mountains so it's so lush and so beautiful and and it gets cold actually <laughs> and and so okay so it's going to take a couple of days to get there and then i want to spend at least a, a couple of days there and then i want to kind of explore more of the country so just adding it up and it's like, oh, oh, okay. So I think 10, 11 days will get me to where I want to go and it's not going to be overwhelming and, and I'm not going to start to miss everything in my home in Malaysia. And, and so it was a good balance. So at this point, I prefer these, these shorter trips and having a home base somewhere versus just like taking a bag or, or a backpack or a suitcase and just kind of going for the long haul and, and seeing how far you make it. Hmm. And so did you see the footprint? I did. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, it wasn't, it was a little bit anticlimactic, uh, climactic, but the, the temple there was amazing. And, and I was the only foreigner there. Uh, they had tour buses, but it was uh, like Indians and other Sri Lankans. And uh, it wasn't any, any foreign tourists, uh, per se, like any white tourists, uh, which was really cool to see. And then I got the blessing from the monk. And I, I left the donation and, uh, and then I found out that there's four places in the world that Hanuman has left a footprint. And now I kind of want to go see the rest <laughs> of them. <laughs> That's an awesome quest. I so yeah. get that. You know, I was once looking in a magazine. I don't even know where, it doesn't matter. I saw a picture of Cinque Terre, which is in Italy. <laughs> and I lost it. I just was like, I don't know where that is in that country, I have to go there. And that was literally what got me to Italy. And I booked um, a 16 day trip by myself, very fluid, right? You know, I just right. sort of knew, knew I'll be like here for three days, I'll be here for three days, I'm gonna this, this, you know, I, it was really a beautiful itinerary I set up for myself. And um, Eli, I remember probably 65% through the trip, I was staying in this beautiful hotel in the Liguria. Oh, I really love Italy. I know you can't tell. I love Italy. And yeah, I had no idea. <laughs> I took a train to Cinque Terre by myself. I had my little, you know, my hiking boots and my backpack for the day, my little food I was going to eat. And I remember most people take 
three to five days to do Cinque Terre, but this is so me. I did it an entire day. It's perfect. And you know, it was so beautiful doing it that way. Like I was a hundred percent immersed in the hike along the cliffs. And at one point I stopped. <clears throat> I think somebody took a, I was able to find someone to take a picture of me. And it's like all of a sudden I breathed and looked around and went, oh my God, I'm here. Like I can mm. cry, you know? I'm here in the picture, the picture that got me here, that pulled my energy, my being forward into this particular moment. I'm living it right now. And so I understand the profundity of seeing something or learning something and knowing I need to experience that. Whatever that takes, I need to follow that quest. Uh, and it's a beautiful thing, you know, to go from idea and inception and imagination to reality. Definitely. For sure. And, and I know you went to Costa Rica a few months ago in, in November or something like that, wasn't it? October. Yeah. October. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm sure that was such an amazing time as, as well. <laughs> yes, it was beautiful. I mean, I went there to do ayahuasca and to stay at a resort for a week and do some very deep, <clears throat> excuse me, healing work <clears throat> and exploration. And I went to a part, of, I've been to Costa Rica before. I was, this was, I'd never been to this side of Costa Rica, really lush and beautiful and very beachy and a lot of surfers. And, and I had um, an amazing experience. And it's interesting you would bring that up, Eli, because honestly, the first time I went to Costa Rica, I sort of had judgment about it. And I left mm -hmm. and I went, well, it's very peaceful. It is a, one of the most well-read, smart countries, very interesting, beautiful fruit and coffee and, and the people, uh, it's you know sort of Switzerland. They're not gonna get involved in a war. And I liked all of that. The terrain is spectacular. The people were wonderful, but I just didn't resonate. I tend to be a European gal. <laughs> and so I was like, this was great. I was here for three weeks. I'm glad I did it, ta-da. But because I went back for this experience and I got to experience a whole nother part of Costa Rica, I got to tell you, I'm kind of in love with it now. <laughs> and like, much like you were talking about Vedic astrology, you know, sometimes part of astrology is your astrocartography, which is the lines of your astrology and where you would best live, be in love, career, money, being, health, all of that. And it turns out I've got a line in Costa Rica. So... Uh, it, it's now become a place like, oh, I would consider having like a second or third home there. I loved yeah. it that much. That'd be awesome. Right? I, I've never been, so I, I don't know, but I, I've only heard amazing things about it. And, and uh, it's on my list for places to go. And, and hopefully soon I'll be able to make it there. Mm, yeah, well worth it. And just get your timing down for weather because it sure can rain in the autumn, yeah. right? Uh, I'm used to I'm used to rainy season. <laughs> yeah, we went. We woke up one morning really, really early because we wanted to go zip lining. I'd never been zip lining, and they said, "Don't worry, the rain doesn't hit till about twelve o'clock. So if you do like an eight a.m. run, you'll be fine." Well, uh, the gods were not. They were like, "No, we don't." No. Oh, no. <laughs> the whole shuttle ride for thirty minutes. It was like cats and dogs. We got there. Oh. We hung out and had a coffee and a laugh and a video, and we're like, well, "It's not going to happen." So, yeah. <laughs> Next time, though. Next time. And so I understand that you have a theory or a story about bamboo. And I would love to hear what that is. How is bamboo prevalent or what kind of lessons are there from bamboo? Yeah, great. So I, I, I really like Japan. I, I don't know if you were able to tell at all. Uh, but I've, I've been there multiple times since the first trip. And, and they have this bamboo forest in, in Kyoto. And basically, you just, it's like a long corridor with, with bamboo on either side. And, and it's just so lush and, and so tranquil. And it's just beautiful to walk through. And, and I don't know if, if your listeners are aware, that, but in, in Asia, bamboo is used for scaffolding a lot when you're building something because it's really strong and, and durable. And, and so when, you, when I was walking down through the bamboo, it, uh, did I, did I lose you? I'm still here. Oh, I think we're frozen. Well, I'm going to speak until 
Eli comes back, you know, in these interesting times when everybody's on a, a cell phone, a computer, a, an iPad, and I, everything. Yeah, it's like- Sorry bamboo. about that. It's okay, my love. <clears throat> but you were saying you were walking through the corridor of the bamboo. Yeah, and, and then there's just a, a really gentle breeze. And the bamboo is just swaying. And, and, and if, if you're lucky, there's, there's no one around you. The, the first time I went, it was winter. And nobody likes to be cold, including me. So I don't know why, why I was there. But um, it was really cold. And there wasn't really anyone there. And you're just seeing all this bamboo just slightly move. And, and it, then you look up and you realize it's, it's moving much further than, than you thought, just from this, this little breeze. And, and, and so it's like, wow, that's, that's really interesting. But it's still, it's still strong. It's still durable. It's, it's, it's flexible. And a lot of times people are a little bit too rigid for what's going on. And, and they think that their goals, their plans, uh, whatever their, their desired outcome is, they, it has to go a really specific way in order for them to get what they want. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case at all. It, it's, uh, you have your, your intention, your desired outcome, and, and you keep that in mind. And then you, you move forward to, to solve it, to, to fulfill it by, by taking the steps that you think are necessary. But if at any point it starts to divert or something else comes along that kind of sidetracks you, or maybe even leads you to something better, it's, do you want, do you want what you were so focused on or do you want something better? So it's, it's that whole thing is that um, being, being still strong willed in what you want and, and flexible and being open to more things that I, I think is so profound that um, it's one of the things that I took away from walking through the bamboo forest. Mm, how beautiful. And so is it like um, taking control versus slowing down? Is it uh, being rigid as you called it versus being in flow? Are those different principles? Well, uh, so being in flow is basically inner and outer alignment and that nature is working for you. And, and with bamboo, it's, it's, you can just look and, and see, it's still, it's still growing up. It's still, it's still getting the wind, to, feeling the wind and, and enjoying all that it offers. And um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought for some reason. And, and so uh, being in flow is, is helping move forward to this point. And, and sometimes we're, we're too focused on, on the goal and too focused on being in control that we lose sight of what's really important. So uh, for, for, for me, I, I'm supposed to be in Malaysia right now because that's where I was currently living and all of this happened and basically the whole world shut down. And it was actually really frustrating for me and it, it took me a couple of weeks to get over. But now I'm realizing that this is a really good thing for me in order to accomplish my goals and desires with the business, with getting um, peace and harmony out there and getting all these, these pockets of peace everywhere. And I don't think there's a better place for me to be in order to move that forward. Oof, that's but at, at, sorry, what were you saying? That's big. That is, I mean, I under, I really understand. And I love the fact that you were able to surrender enough somewhere inside of you that the clarity came up and said, wow, if I had been where I said I needed to be and should be, Malaysia, I would not be having the space and the capacity in order to accomplish that which is so important for me right now and for the company. So it's really right. a blessing. And when you say nature works for you, this is a perfect example. Yeah. So it, it was a, it was uncomfortable at first. It, I, I was a bit stubborn and hard headed, being like, "Oh no, like I, I I need to be there," and and having that story play in my head. And then once I was finally able to calm down and, and come back to it, it's like, okay, well, actually, this is all supporting what I'm what I'm working for, and there's this is the optimal environment for me because I don't have many distractions here and I can really just focus on, on all this work. So that's what we talk about when we're being in flow and, and kind of letting go of control to, to a certain extent that it's, we focus on what it is that we really want and not the, the short term of it. Does, does that make sense? It does make sense. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> I call it widening back. 
Because oh, awesome. when I do in the face of something, I'm myopic. And it's like, no, I want that. I need that. I want that. I need that. It's right. so I completely widen my being back. <clears throat> you know, I can see a matrix. And if I can't mm. see a matrix, something will come to me. It always does. And it's really like important principle. That's my flow, if you will, for me to remind myself, because I'm a creator, you know? <laughs> and right, so right. I have to remember some of my most potent creations come when I let go of the reins, when I let go, of just let something happen. And it, and it may end up more magnificent than I could have dreamed. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and that's what we're talking about when we're saying to, to when you get in flow and, and to why letting go of control is, or slowing down can actually help speed up your progress is because if you're, if you're constricting all your, all your creativity and being like, oh, I, I need to this graphic this certain way. And, and now it's getting frustrating, but then as soon as you let go and, and then start to explore into all these avenues and then things kind of just start to work out and, and you come up with something even more beautiful than you had imagined before. Yes. I love this. Letting go of control to speed up progress. Woof. That's a, that's a right there. Like a, it, marker, right. If you can. Yeah. If you can do that, it's, it's, it can be difficult. It, it can be difficult. Um, one of the ways to do it is just, we have this red balloon technique. Do you mind if I share it real quick? Please, I'd love it. Uh, so I mean, we're, we're big on like meditations and, and that sort of thing, right? And if you do an, a meditation, first thing in the morning is always good. If you can't do it first thing in the morning, whenever you can do it is better than not doing it. Uh, so you just kind of close your eyes and, and whatever you feel is, is holding you back or, or weighing you down, you just... Uh, you just kind of gather all that up and above your head, you have this big red balloon, this empty red balloon, and you just start filling it up, breathing up all that, uh, all that garbage, um, all that um, energy that you think you need to be constricted and, and act in a certain way. And you just keep breathing all that up until the balloon is full. It, it may take a couple of minutes. It may take a couple of seconds. It depends on, on how you're feeling, what's going on with you. And then once that balloon is full, you just close up the top and, and let it drift away and let it slowly start to drift away. And it just gets further and further and further and starts to fade away and just keeps going until it completely disappears and, and it doesn't exist anymore. And then you just take a minute or two and then open your eyes and come back and, and see how you feel. And then you can approach whatever activity in that new way regarding this. It's like, it's, it's okay that it doesn't work out exactly the way you want it to. Mm, I love that. That was really nice. Yum, yum, yum. And very simple. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Wow. Um, yeah, this is such a good conversation. It's such a relevant conversation right now. And one of the things, Eli, that you do out in the world and that you also help people with is how to align ourselves with our true calling, which I really appreciate because we've got goals, we've got visions, we've got decisions, and then we've got this unique calling. And so sometimes they're aligned, sometimes they're misaligned. I actually feel like people right now are feeling that more than ever. There's the peop, the contention of people like, I hate my job. This is, it sucks that I don't have money right now. Maybe I'm not working at that job, but I really hated that job. So it's great to have this time. And then there are people like, you know, I'm really reevaluating. I mean, I love everything I do, but I'm a major reevaluation. Not like I'm leaving the podcast. I don't mean that, but I know there are really deep, frankly, healing principles I want to bring into my life. As, as even regarding being a healer, stepping way more into that uh, shamanistic aspect of who I am. And so that idea of aligning with, oops, aligning with our true calling or releasing our earrings in real time. <laughs> that works too. Make, right? <laughs> I'm really widening back. Um, how can we make that happen? How can we align with a true goal? And um, how can we, yeah, I just would love some guidance there. Like, what do you do? What do you know? Yeah, I, I got another meditation for that. <laughs> okay. So uh, what, what I, 
I do is intention based. And, and I know you've talked to other people about intentions and, and about how important they are. And I, I definitely agree with all of that. Uh, so lately what we've been doing is you, you can do this by yourself. You can do this with your team. It, it doesn't matter. We've been doing these team intention meditations every day huh. for a, about 15 or 20 minutes. And, and what we do is we set our intentions. So uh, for that meditation, it's more business um, intentions. But then if you're doing it on your own, any, any personal in, intentions you have, like, like so what kind of impact do you want to have on the world? How do you want to, how do you want to show up for people? What are the experiences that you want to have? And, and whatever, whatever your goals are, I, I suggest writing it down because it, help solidify it and then you can always look at it for reference and then once you have those you say okay uh so for example one of ours is the one million pockets of peace for the u.s by july 4th so now we meditate on that attention we focus on on, on pulling that and, and creating that and one of the ways we do that is by framing it as if we already have it and feeling how we would feel when we already have it. So when we have these 1 million pockets of peace for the US, how is that gonna make us feel? And, and for me personally, that's, that's huge. Like I get excited thinking about it. I, I, and, and then there's so many other possibilities that come with it. Like if we can do it in, in, these, in this country, then why can't we do it in Brazil, in India, in, in Europe? There's no reason we can't. So it opens so many avenues up that you can go and explore. And you just focus on that for a couple of minutes and put your attention on how it feels when you already have that. And then after a couple of minutes, you, you come back, you open your eyes and starting your day like that is, is so profound. It's so huge because you're already excited. You're already motivated about what it is that, that you want to do. That's beautiful. So now we've learned the red balloon technique and then we have learned the intention setting meditation, which you can do with your team for business, that's fantastic. And especially, you know, anybody who follows, gosh, I wanna get it right, but I'm quite sure it's Lynn McTaggart who did the intention experiment. Um, genius, the power of eight, where she got eight people together to pray for somebody and hold an intention for somebody and miracles happen. Oh, I have wow. to say, I, I became part, um, one of her workshops, I was in one of her groups and they held an intention for me. And things literally changed when I walked out of that room. So there is great potency here. And so you can do it alone, but you could also do it as a team. And what I also like about the team piece is that even though you're meditating independently on a, a group decided intention, you know, look, energy's everything. So there's gotta be a synergy that gets created amongst people. And I would imagine people get along a little better when you've got that going on and you're not even working at it. Right. And, and, and it's part of work. And if you're someone like me who doesn't really like working, mm -hmm. it's perfect. But no, you, you get together, you're doing this every day for a few minutes and, and you just start to appreciate each other so much more and, and the value that, that everyone can bring to your, your common goal and, and just the value of them as an individual. And, and I, I'm, I'm so, I'm so grateful for it. I, this morning I'm doing it. And, and one of the things I'm always thinking of is like, it, I'm so, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to, to be with, with these people and, and to be all working for this and, and for this to be the perfect time for all of this to happen. Where can people find you? Where can people work with you or know what you're up to? Yeah, awesome. Uh, Peaceandharmonyco.com is our main website. It's, it needs a little bit of work. It's supposed to be done by now, but you know how that goes. Uh, and then if they want to learn more about flow and, and all that, then we have a quiz they can go to at takethisquiznow.com. And I think it's like 10, 11 questions, and it'll give them a level of flow and alignment that they are, and, and then give them some helpful some tips and, and little tricks. And then if they want to schedule a clarity call with one of our, one of our team members, they can do that as well. And uh, peace and harmony download.com for the, the free peace and harmony program and to have their own little pocket of peace. Mm. This is dare to dream. Eli, what are you next year to dream? Oh, 
I've got <laughs> um, <laughs> big goals. Uh, a million pockets apiece for the U.S., and then I want uh, I want the same for Brazil and India, and I want it to spread all around at a viral rate and definitely create a, a more uh, harmonious world. Thank and you. it starts with um, just being at home and being with the ones you love and, and having the least amount of friction as possible. I appreciate you so much. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me, Debbie. I, I appreciate you taking the time and, and speaking to me and, and thank you so much. Pleasure. More to come. And I end today's show with this quote from Chrissy Jammy. To share your weakness is to make yourself vulnerable. To make yourself vulnerable is to show your strength. Subscribe to the Dare to Dream podcast and hear this number one weekly transformation conversation. My upcoming guest is Robert McPhee, founder of Excellent Decisions and former director of training for Jack Canfield, as well as third time on her show, Dr. Sue Mortar will be here again. She's amazing and transformational, and I know we're going to be having one of those conversations. If you love the podcast and you would like to see me and my fabulous guest, go to debbiedashinger.com. Uh, excuse me, I'm going to take you to YouTube instead. Go to youtube.com slash debbiedashinger. youtube.com slash debbiedashinger. People have been loving seeing us and enjoying the show that way. And remember, if it is your time and I can be of service, if you have a book to write, but you don't even know how to get started, join my group membership. It's debbiedashinger.com slash visible visionaries. I am taking people from the inception of their book to finished and done and published. And if instead, or and or, you would like to write a chapter because you're a dog lover or you're in the pet industry, canine, vet, service dog, there's so many different places for people who love puppies. I've got a book that is rolling out. It's a compilation and it's called the ultimate anthology book for dog lovers. And of course, ultimate is spelled mutt, ultimate. And it's positively fabulous. And if you'd like to write a chapter, go to debbyd.net, it's D-E-B-B-I-D.net slash anthology. Join us there. I'm taking you through the entire huge experience, including taking the book to a guaranteed international bestseller. I really am here to help you be visible out in the world, to get out your message and your story. So if it's a book, go to debbiedashinger.com slash visible visionaries. And if it's a chapter about a dog, go to debbyd.net slash anthology. And just remember the secret of success always is having the courage to begin in the first place. Thanks for joining us today on the show.